Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, my name is Peter Keltika. I'm the co-founder and CEO at Horizon, where we have built a video game called Skyweaver. It's a trading card game that uses Web3 technology. And we've also built a platform called Sequence, which is an all-in-one developer platform to help you build Web3 games very easily. Uh, excited to be here, so thank you for joining us. And uh, yeah, can't really see you guys all because of these crazy lights, um, but I will try. So I actually want to start off uh, just with a quick show of hands. And I'd love to kind of understand and just see by hands, who here in the audience is skeptical that Web3 gaming uh, or Web3 within video games makes sense? Any skeptics? Uh, someone's got to be a skeptic. <laughs> OK, well then, that's, I don't believe you. But, um, <laughs> but how about, by show of hands then, who is a believer that Web3 has a place um, in video games? Amazing, wow. I'm going home. See you later. <laughs> um, OK, well, that's very cool. So very surprising, um, but still very, very interesting. So anyways, today's agenda, we're going to take you through a few things. Uh, we're going to talk about, like, why would you build a Web3 game? What are the new opportunities? Uh, we're going to hear from Robbie at Super Gaming going from a Web2 studio, building some Web3 content, really exciting. Um, we're also going to talk about uh, Skyweaver, the development, some of the challenges that we faced and we've overcome in the development. We are going to have a panel with Michael talking a bit about more of some of these things going deeper. And of course, we're going to take Q&A. Um, yeah. So the first off is kind of like, why would you build a Web3 game? And a question I like to think about as well is, what are the new possibilities and opportunities that Web3 unlocks for players and creators? So what, what's kind of new? And an area that I like to think about as well as a reference point is really thinking about, as this is kind of an evolutionary aspect of, of gaming and kind of a new thing, I like to think of this as a new dimension of gaming. And something I like to reference is thinking again other parts of gaming, right? Um, and I like to think of this as similar to a shift of going from like single player to multi, uh, you know, single player game to a multiplayer game. I remember when I was, you know, playing Commander Keen, Duke Nukem 3D, Command and Conquer in my basement with my buddies, and it was just single player game. And it was amazing, super fun. And then all of a sudden, my buddy's like, "Yo, we can play Duke Nukem 3D on like against each other over the over the over our modems, over our 33.6.6 baud modem." I'm like, no way, man. We, like, is it going to work? We dial into each other. Someone sets up the server. We call in. We're playing each other. It's frigging insane. We're in this football field. I'm shooting this, shooting this guy. Change, it, it blew my mind. I couldn't believe it was a thing. Um, and then, of course, same thing with like Red Alert, playing my buddy across the street. We're playing against each other. It was an entirely new dimension. It changed the game for me completely. It was a completely different experience. Everything changed for me. And of course, as we know, not every game needs to be multiplayer. But when you do have multiplayer, there's a lot of interesting effects that it has. And I think of, you know, again, I think of Web3 offering this new dimension. It's something that I'd like to explore. This is the way I kind of think about it. Um, I think as well, you know, when you think about the first generation of Web3 games, really I'd like to, I think it's, it's understood that they're really first generation, right? They're early, they're, everyone was really thinking about, the first thing everyone thought about, and I've talked to so many game studios and developers, is they were like, they're, they all were stumbling on the blockchain stuff. They all needed to become experts in like proof of work consensus and proof of stake consensus and blockchains and how does it scale and which chain should I go on and how do you develop report, how do you get smart contracts and what goes on chain, what goes off chain, like all of these things that have nothing to do with their video game, you know, nothing to do with their actual like thing that's like, what are you designing for, what are the properties? And of course, so naturally a lot of the games were very, were focused around that and they were really early experiments and it was also a very, a very much a moving target. Um, and I think that's kind of settling down and converging um, in kind of standard practice and you can see that. And so similarly, like I think if you were to tell me back then when I was playing Duke Nukem with 3D with my buddy, and if you were to tell me like, oh yeah, this multi, these multiplayer formats, they're gonna, people are gonna be professional gamers, they're gonna be like playing like, a, like an eSport, there's gonna be hundreds of thousands of viewers on this, I would say you're crazy, there's no way. I, mean, I would say my mom will pick up the phone and cancel your game pretty fast, you know? <laughs> Disconnecting your bot modem. And so, just wouldn't believe it. And so when I think about Web3 and I think about the shift, I like to think around the aspect of, of the items themselves, right? So like what part of the format, what part of the game is the, kind of this new dimension being like layered into? And now again, it's the items. And when you think about the items, and of course, as we know, the virtual items are very well understood within video games. And of course, now we have this, I like to sometimes call them like virtual items 3.0 or something, right? This idea that now we have an open standard and format for representing these goods in a way that can be standardized across all video games and can offer certain kind of benefits um, and, and extensibilities and so forth. Um, and as we know them as NFTs and SFTs, you know, non-fungible tokens, semi-fungible tokens, or just quite simply digital collectibles that are on the blockchain or something like this, right? But beyond that, so that's cool that we have this now open standard and format that can, people can converge on. I like to kind of also think about some of the first principles, um, you know, back to first principle and think about why do people buy items in the first place? You know, why do they do that? Um, what's the motivation behind that? 
And let's just think about Web2 games. Like, why are people buying these items right now in the existing games? And I like to say there's like these three things, and I think they're pretty well understood. Um, one of them, of course, is utility. So, like, okay, you're playing a game, free or not, and you're like, okay, you want to go and unlock a character. So, you're going to go and you're going to spend money because you want that character or you want that item so it can help you advance in the game or be better. You know, that's pretty straightforward. Um, the other one, of course, is status, right? You want to buy something, you want to look cool among your friends, you want to look distinguished, you want it. It's just something that we, we also understand very well in, in virtual worlds. Um, you also love the idea of like just the pleasure of collecting. Like we love to acquire new things and add to our collections and there's this, there's this pleasure to going and unlocking and, and amassing your, your virtual collection. So these are the reasons that, you know, have been talked a lot about um, and feel free to add more in the Q&A if you guys would like to, you know, we can, we can definitely discuss that. When I think about Web3 games now, I also like to ask myself, okay, so what exactly is additive fundamentally? What are the new motivations and incentives by us now allowing them to be to be owned and tradable in all this common format, what's, what are the new motivators? And I like to think there's actually like a five more of these things, right? One is that you actually can now, so obviously we still have the first three, but now we have this idea that there's actually this value. Maybe you're getting a collector, collector, a collector's item, something that has a, something of, of value. Very similar to when you're kind of the notion of like a baseball card, card or a, a Pokemon physical card or a comic book, you're actually going and finding yourself a collector's item that could have an underlying value. So you're like, you know what, I'm gonna buy that because that actually could be valuable one day, that's, that's pretty cool. And there's also, the other aspect around Web3 and the, kind of the notion of how these systems work is that they actually have um, resale markets, right? They have these secondary markets. So like, you know what, I can buy this thing, you know what, I can sell it, I can resell it. Like, maybe I'm not gonna get my money back, but I, I can still resell and get some of my money back. And that's not actually another motivator, right? Um, you can also think about this idea of this cross-game interoperability. It's like, okay, I'm gonna buy this item, I'm gonna have this item, and you know what, maybe another future game developer, indie or big, may actually decide to actually allow me to use this item or have some kind of reference point, some kind of, they may seem like, oh, that's interesting, like your, your background on what you have, so I can maybe take advantage of that. That could be cross IP, but could also be within the same IP. You know, one of our colleagues, Andre, in the crowd here, we were discussing the other day, and, and I was like, we we're talking about Final Fantasy, and I said, Andre, what would you like to see in like Final Fantasy with Web3? And he said, you know what would be cool? He's like, I'd like to take my items from like the prior Final Fantasy and into a newer Final Fantasy, right? I think that's pretty cool. I think that actually makes a lot of sense. Um, the other aspect is, of course, persistence, right? These items persist with you. They live with you because they're actually not on a database of the video game. They're actually on a blockchain. So it's very interesting that they persist and they exist forever beyond the video game, which, of course, kind of layers into these things. So why you want to buy it? Well, because it's yours forever, right? Um, and then finally, we have this idea of your collection history and your profile. And it's very interesting that, so now you're amassing these things over a long period of time, and you're kind of showing up, imagine you show up to a new video game, and you're kind of presenting all the things that you have and all the things that you've done and you've collected. That actually really distinguishes you in that game and maybe will give you certain rewards or certain kind of capabilities. And that game actually is also going to be quite interested in knowing your, your history and your profile. So these are other motivators and incentives. Why would you buy these items? And they're a very big deal. Um, again, it's like these are the fundamentals. And I think what I, kind of to, to make you think about is, you know, it is early days and these, and what can you really design with them, right? When you're thinking about your game format, how do you leverage them in a creative way that can offer you a better player experience, that can drive more engagement, that can drive more retention, and of course with monetization. And there's so much possibilities, and I think it's the idea of less worrying about the blockchain technology and the frictions and what blockchain should you go on and how do you do this stuff. There are so many providers like, like, like us, but like many others, that are really standardizing, converging on a, lot of, on a lot of approaches. And I'd love to see developers spend more time thinking about their integrations in Web3 and thinking about these primitives and feel free to think about other ones from first principle. Um, yeah, so that's, that's kind of it. And, and I think the other thing I'll kind of mention would be, I think there, you don't, you can, there's different aspects. There's like a spectrum of how hardcore do you go and how deep do you go in Web3 to leverage all of these properties? Do you want them all? Or maybe you, do you want to join your whole system in such a way that is so encompassed in, in, in a way like we have done actually with Skyweaver really tying the whole thing in together, or maybe there's just like a lightweight integration that you can take on. So we'll talk more about that later, but just saying that I think they're all, they're all you know, cool, right? And they're all interesting, so as long as they're additive to the player experience and they, they help with that. So next, we're actually gonna invite uh, Robbie onto the stage, and he's gonna share his story um, coming with, as a Web2 studio and building some cool stuff in Web3, and then we'll, we'll, we'll flip back into other stuff. So Robbie, welcome to the stage. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, Peter. <laughs> Uh, thank you, everybody, for giving me a chance to talk. My name is Robbie. This is my 13th GDC, but the first one as a speaker. Uh, I'm the founder and CEO of Super Gaming. Uh, gaming is an expression of your art and culture, uh, and we find ourselves underrepresented in the world of gaming, and Super Gaming is putting Indian art and culture on, onto the world of gaming. Uh, 
I want to spend the next couple of minutes impressing you with my credentials as a game maker before I talk about Web3, because Peter's already done a lot of the Web3 talk. Um, our, series, our story started small. I'm officially the first iPhone developer from India. I started when the iPhone first came out. Our story is better known as Three Guys, a Dog in a Dream. Uh, started by building educational games uh, through a company called Tap to Learn uh, with my founders, run it through YC, uh, ran it in the Silicon Valley till about 2014 before I went back and kind of built a real game engine company called, called June. Uh, 2019, our first game became a massive hit, after which we decided to become a publisher ourselves, and Super Gaming is kind of our publisher label. Uh, we're a bunch of people that's worked together for a very, very long time. Me and my co-founders, Namneet Singh Vadech, who we just call W, have worked together for the last 21 years. Uh, the rest of my co-founders have also worked with me for over a decade. <clears throat> our journey has been a couple of things. Uh, building out our games platform that actually powers all of our games. Today, our games platform called Super Platform is actually sold by Google Cloud as the only third-party game platform on Google Cloud. Uh, we specialize in only one kind of game, which is real-time multiplayer games that came in as a background of being a good iPhone developer uh, from 2008, but being a back-end engineer for 10 years before that. Uh, we combined both of that to really become just good multiplayer developers, and that's really hard. The last 18 months, I've spent building Web3, uh, and I want to share with you parts of that journey. Uh, our last five games have been downloaded over 200 million times. Uh, these games are played endlessly. Uh, the, cr the critical part of all of this is that we didn't spend any money on marketing. Uh, we got 200 million users organically. Uh, and that's really how we've actually built our games, and I'll share a little bit about what we do. Um, we're specialists in building shooters, uh, but what we did was to actually bring Indian content inside of it. We celebrate Diwali inside of the game, uh, and we actually found a large audience uh, coming in and sharing the same culture, trying to understand what Diwali is. And we actually got a lot of, I can see somebody smiling in the front. Uh, you know, uh, the character out there is not a Maharaja, not Bahubali. Uh, that's how I see myself in the mirror. Uh, in fact, my dad used to have a handlebar mustache as well. Uh, and that's really what we think about video games, expressing putting yourself inside of it. I'm very excited today to talk a little bit about my new game coming out uh, called Indus. Uh, Indus is a battle royale set in an Indo-futuristic universe. Uh, battle royales are the eSport of India. 450 million gamers in India play a battle royale game. Uh, so it's, really, it's literally a game that everybody's playing in India. India is one of the largest markets for games as well. And we decided to build one. Uh, there's no battle royale built in India, so we decided to build one for India in India. Uh, Indus is an Indo-futuristic battle royale, which means that it kind of borrows heavily from what we saw the movie Black Panther do with Afrofuturism, which is combine the glorious past culture of Africa, but also said that Wakanda is, is kind of, you know, the most futuristic city in the world. We are building the Wakanda of India inside of Indus. Uh, I'd love for you to go and take a look at it and see our game on indusgame.com, uh, but it's also available on pre-registration. We opened the game out for pre-registration two weeks ago, and we have got 1.8 million pre-registered users. <clears throat> uh, so now, I, while I've kind of impressed you with my background as a Web2 game company, uh, I want to talk about why Web3, uh, and what are we really doing uh, in the seminar talking about Web3. Uh, like everything else, what kind of inspired us to think about Web3 was our players. Uh, we've got players playing our game for over five years uh, and still playing the game. And, you know, for, for pretty much the same reasons that, that Peter mentioned, you know, status, tradability, ownership, long-time retention, uh, players actually came back to us and said that, hey, wouldn't it be great if you carried out these items from your last game into the next game? Or maybe, you know, were able to kind of trade with each other, and that's really what we did. Uh, we started small, uh, but we also started with some key principles. Uh, the first principle was, you know, nothing was kind of building a speculation, but kind of building a real game, a fun game, a game that competes with our free-to-play games, which have been running for the last five years. We don't see our Web3 games as being any different. Um, what we did was to build the sequel of our game, Tar Conquest, as a new Web3 game that's available on both iOS and Android in the stores, as Tar Conquest Metaverse Edition, or TCME for short. Let me show you what we built. Uh, first of all, the game is what we call free to earn or free to get started. You don't really need to buy an NFT to start playing the game. Uh, it's proven gameplay. The gameplay has been proven over five years, millions of hours of gameplay on our original Web2 game called Tar Conquest. Uh, but what we added to it is our speciality, which is building a real-time multiplayer aspect to it. So now you're actually playing the game against your friends socially. Uh, thanks to Sequence, we also added an easy onboarding and no messy wallets to kind of be within it. Uh, but the third part of it is also something that we thought about deeply. Our games, the reason that our games have been played for over five years is because we focus heavily on economy. Uh, and this time, we wanted to think about Web3 from what we call a sustainable economy. 
game assets or items as Peter referred to them, are really key to this economy. What we wanted to think about are not vanity items, but utility items. What we said is that all of your game assets should be earned in the game, they should be tradable by players. At the same time, what we call sustainable is that you shouldn't have to depend on an influx of new players for the game to keep running. And that's really what we've seen as the crashes of the last couple of years. Let me show you how we did it. Uh, so what you see here is the game, you're actually fighting with two towers, you're playing a real-time PvP game. What you see on the bottom are a bunch of units cards. Uh, and the ones with numbers written under them are what we call SFTs or semi-fungible tokens. They're different from NFTs. In an NFT, you have a bunch of randomly generated stats, which confuses players in terms of what's the value pricing for, for all of it. In our case, uh, when you choose that, that leftmost item there, which has 170 on the top and zero down, you're actually choosing a golem that is exactly the same stats as everybody else. When you deploy an SFT, you're actually burning that token. Uh, and that's something that's unique to our game, and I'll explain later. Uh, but that's really how we thought about a SFT-based economy inside of this game. On the right-hand side, where it says 500 on the top, you see that it doesn't have a charge now. That's an NFT. Uh, and that's also, that's also a very powerful unit, uh, a very powerful unit that doesn't get consumed every time that you deploy it in the game. NFTs are rare. They only make up 5% of our entire economy. Uh, and that's really why they accrue value as players kind of upgrade it. In our newer versions, we also have the ability for an NFT to be upgraded. Our idea of kind of building this game was to think about focusing on what's the maximum number of game time or plays, play of number of games that a player will play. Uh, when you talk about the core loop of the game, uh, we wanted to create an economy where inverse to what we saw happen last year, we wanted to create an economy where older players are actually incentivizing newer players to play. What we saw in the crash is that mostly older players cashed out on the influx of new players, and that's really where that economy died. What we wanted to do slightly differently was to think about, hey, you've got your campaign mode, which is free to play. You earn a token called Essence. You use that Essence to train units and create unit cards. You use those unit cards inside of your PvP battles. Uh, now, when you think about it, if you want to keep playing the game and compete against other players to kind of move higher up the leaderboard, you want to go back to the, to the newer players who are coming in, creating essence, which is limited in quantity, and trading with them to kind of create cards that you'll further use in your economy. With that, we were able to create an economy where older players were actually encouraging newer players to come in and trade with them, and also accruing real value for all of the items that they created. This is really how we thought about it, slightly different. Uh, the funny part is, in our tournament that we launched, uh, we actually had a top player incentivizing, you know, 20 members of his entire community to go and create essence for him and train, create cards for him. So that's something that kind of brought in a lot of players organically. Uh, we launched mid-January. Uh, we put about 10,000 users, all organic, uh, 1,000 DAU, which is about 2,000 right now. Uh, but the critical part is our Web3 game has almost the same stats as our Web2 game especially from session time. People are playing the game for 70 minutes in a day. Uh, our D1, D3 retention is about the same as our F2P game, uh, but our D7 retention and our, and our further retention still needs work, but that's what's coming in in our future versions. Uh, importantly, as players understood the game, they started trading with each other. Uh, we've got over 30,000 tra trades on chain inside of the game, uh, where people are kind of incentivizing, creating communities on social, and getting players from all over the world. Uh, I want to shout out to Sequence uh, in this slide. Creating a Web3 game is hard uh, because comparing it to an F2P game or a free-to-play game, you actually can get started really quickly. But in a Web3 game, you've got to create a wallet, you know, memorize a phrase, you know, fund it with some cash, you know, pay gas fees, uh, all of which is taken away by our integration with Sequence, uh, wherein in a matter of minutes with a social sign-in, players were able to create a wallet and get started playing. Uh, I, want to, I want to call out the entire Sequence team with Mike, Carl, uh, Philippe, and Tolgat uh, for helping us uh, not just you know, create, make this easier for our players, but also make it easy from a developer perspective. We literally had Sequence integrated and working within one day. Uh, and that's, that's really you know, how simple se Sequence has made our life. Uh, I also want to call out my other partners in our Web3 stack, Polygon, uh, on which we run. Uh, which actually made it very, very simple. So Sandeep, Shreyans, Siddharth Jain, uh, Joel, thank you for all of your help in helping us getting started with the Web3 game. 
Uh, finally, uh, some key lessons that we learned while kind of integrating a Web3 game. Uh, we chose not to kind of build the entire marketplace to start with. Uh, marketplaces have liquidity issues. They take a lot of time to kind of think about and build. What we did was to sidestep that problem and allow players to trade socially. Uh, players started trading within themselves. It allowed them to create liquidity, but also find out what the real asset value was. Uh, a next step is obviously to add an AMM like Nifty Swap, where, where we actually have that liquidity, even if you're not connected socially. Uh, and that would, we think, handle all liquidity issues that most marketplaces have. Uh, the demand is driven organically by our community. And our community is one that's grown organically. We obviously have a bunch of Web2 players coming to our Web3 game who already know of the game and know of the gameplay, but now want to kind of experiment with what we call is an on-chain experience. Um, we spent zero dollars to get to our first 10,000 users, and that's really our focus with our community. We kind of created champions within our community who talked about our game, talked about their experience playing it, talked about a new experience. Our Web3 game is different from our Web2 game because you're actually playing a real-time PvP game. Um, What's also very different in our thinking about as a, as a Web2 studio coming to Web3 is that we still focus on the same core metrics. Retention, stickiness, conversion are still the critical parts. Uh, what we think is going to change is that experienced game developers like us are coming in to create true gameplay experiences on Web3, and that's really going to change it to make it a fun experience for players. That's really where we see this next phase of Web3 gaming go. Again, my name is Ravi. Uh, I'm founder of Super Gaming, and we're putting India on the global gaming map. Thank you. Thanks, Robbie. That was awesome, man. Really cool to hear your story. Thank you for sharing. Um, so yeah, and similarly, I want to kind of share with you guys some of the work that we did on Skyweaver. Um, it was kind of what got us started um, on our journey in Web3 back in December 2017. Um, we thought, wouldn't it be cool to do something really neat with these virtual items that you can now own, and, but what can you do with them and we want, what can we help our friends take advantage of? And that was kind of the theme. And so we built um, this video game called Skyweaver. We thought a trading card game would be really an excellent fit where you get to own your cards similar to Magic the Gathering and it could be a one versus one turn-based strategy video game. Um, and we thought it was just a perfect kind of parallel with the kind of aspect of, of trading as well. We can kind of experiment through the entire, um, the whole spectrum of this stuff. And we really wanted to, to make Skyweaver, and we will give you a lot more detail on Skyweaver the game, and actually Eddie, who's sitting at the front seat, he's doing a talk, Eddie, when's your talk? Is it tomorrow? Friday. Friday, yeah. Friday. Eddie's doing an awesome talk on Friday, so if you'd like to hear more about the in-depths of Skyweaver and the things that we're extending, please join us there. Um, yeah, so, but you know, the, the idea of, of Skyweaver and the intention we had set out was, we wanna make a fun game that anyone can play. You don't have to be a blockchain expert, you don't have to know how this stuff works, and we also don't want custody of your assets. Like we don't want to, you know, Frankenstein the blockchain. We want to just keep it pure. We want to keep it the way it's, you know, the way it's been designed um, and building a game around it. Um, yeah, so this is what Skyberry looks like. And uh, yeah, you can, we have 600, actually more, I think it's 660 unique different types of cards now. And you can, they come in different editions as well. So the game is free to play. You can assemble a deck with 30 cards. You can get starter decks as well. And you kind of battle each other in a competitive game. There's a leaderboard and there's different kind of, there's different reward systems as well built into the system that is obviously taking advantage of an open economy. So you can, the items that you have, you own, and you can actually go and, and trade them on, on the marketplace as well. Um, and very interesting kind of reward loop. So we've, we've really gone pretty deep in the whole spectrum to embrace it in full to allow this open flywheel to kind of occur um, and to see how it, how it really could function, take advantage of the full thing. Of course, you can imagine there's been a lot of lessons, which I'll share with you in, in how we've, we solve for these things. Um, what we, of course, aspired to do, and this is a, what we aspired to do was really make it so that you don't have to know about blockchain, like I said, and you could, you could just log in and you can use it on your screen. And today, Skyweaver is available on your desktop, it's available on iPhone, it's available on Android, and tablets as well. Uh, this is an example of our marketplace that's built in. And so some of the, the problem areas that we, we hit during the development of the game, which we recognized very early, as early as you know, January 2018, um, you know, when, when building up the game, the first thing we thought about was, okay, what part of the game goes on a blockchain and what part of it doesn't go on the blockchain, you know? And how are we gonna make it fast enough? And how can we make users actually be able to use this stuff knowing that the existing wallets that exist today are really kind of financially oriented. They're really oriented around trading, financial type of goods, you know, or using, you know, MetaMask and so forth, like, which is a really innovative and amazing wallet product, but very raw and low level to you know, talk to these protocols at a really raw level. So we really were like, that's obviously not gonna, my cousin won't be able to use that, my nephew won't be able to use that, 
um, that's not going to really work. And so the idea of the wallets were, were, were front and facing for us that we were experimenting and exploring from that very time. The other thing aspect of it, and we'll kind of cover, and we, we, need, we needed a gamer wallet. We needed a wallet that it would be really simple and just kind of like connecting to this stuff. We, gas fees are also like a major issue in that if you don't have the token from the lending gas, you can't do anything. How do you actually buy items, right? So we'll cover it, we'll talk about gas. How do you actually buy items that may exist on a marketplace or on a, on a storefront that lives on a blockchain where people don't actually have any funds in their wallet? How can you bridge that gap? How can you connect these worlds? Very important if you're gonna be looking to monetize your game, which of course everybody wants to. How can you render the, the items that you have inside of your wallet? Because from a game, you don't actually have, for instance, you know, the source of truth is the blockchain, it's not a database. So you, again, you wanna think about that. How do you also represent your, NFT, your, your, your actual items on a blockchain? How do you encode them and actually have them be represented in a way that can function on these systems? What is exactly the right structure around NFTs and SFTs? And then of course, how do you go and establish a secondary marketplace that's really user-friendly and secure and so forth like this? And then which network do you deploy this, all this stuff on? So these are all like the challenges that pretty much everyone's probably thinking of right now when you're looking at it. Um, and maybe even for some folks, not knowing necessarily how to get started, maybe that's also like a factor. Um, but that, you know, through tutorials and examples, that stuff gets a lot easier as these underlining problems have, have really been, have been solved. And so we have released Sequence and it's been in market for the last year. And um, it's really all about build, offering you this kind of full stack that solves all these different problems to help you very easily build and establish your games with Web3 properties. And um, so kind of going through a little bit of going a bit more deeper on this, you know, Sequ the sequence wallet where it all kind of starts with, there is, we have a number of SDKs, whether it's, it's for the web, it's in Unity, Unreal, um, and for mobile. So we make it very easy for you to kind of be able to add this, this wallet product into your, your products. And one of the neat things about it is it just takes two clicks for you to actually, for a user to sign in. You can use your Gmail, you can use your email, like, so, so, like you know, Google authentication or Facebook authentication, different OAuth providers to be able to sign in with, the, with your social credential. And not have to worry about handling seed phrases. How do you think about them and, and how do you do recovery and kind of be presented with these things that are really difficult and, and dangerous to, to handle. Um, one of the, the, neat, the, the innovations that we've taken on in our product is very early is the sequence wallet itself is actually a smart contract in of itself. It's a smart contract based wallet. Uh, you guys might have heard of this idea of account abstraction. I'm not going to go, we can do Q&A if you guys want to go into that. I'm not going to go into that rabbit hole. But what's, what's interesting about this wallet product and is that it's a different wallet primitive, fundamentally at a technical level, in that most wallets, call it like your ledger or your MetaMask or your whatever, there's a single key. You have one key, your key equals your wallet. In this case, your keys are just authentication to the actual wallet. The wallet is a contract. Your assets or your items live inside the wallet. And you can have multiple keys that can sign together, that get combined, and are actually able to produce a valid signature. And that's, and allows you to actually rotate these keys and allow you to kind of handle, like I'll give you more control over how you kind of balance this aspect of security and usability. So the stuff I'm saying is stuff you don't necessarily have to worry about. You build into the SDKs, which by the way are open source, and you can actually go, so you can look at them and, and see how they function. And of course, the, also the contract code is also open source and been audited and so forth. So, but this is a very important part um, to be able to solve the ability for users to onboard in a way that is fully seamless and they don't have to think about blockchain. It's just invisible to them, right? And the wallet itself as well is really companion to your game. It's not trying to take your users away. The, the wallet as actually belongs to the user. It's the user's wallet. They're just showing up. They're authenticating into your system. They're saying, I am this person. I am, the, this is my credentials. I am self-authenticating myself into your product, which is very different in fact. And if you follow the idea of like pass keys and some of the new modern authentication schemes, they're actually very similar. They actually parallel very much actually what's happening in, in these, these mechanisms. Um, so yeah, while it's big thing, big deal, um, I'm happy to chat more about them. The other aspect of course, that's a big friction point is, in fact, funny enough, like some wallets, it's actually really easy to make a wallet. You can, like an EOA wallet, you can actually just generate a random number, you got yourself a wallet. Like it's literally a wallet and you're allowed a library. That's how easy it can be. That's not the case with sequence because there's the multi-key thing. But you got yourself a wallet, but then you maybe even acquired an item. Maybe you've played the game, you actually somehow got it, but now you actually want to do something with it, but you're on the Polygon network or you're on the Avalanche network or you're on whatever network, and you don't have the underlying token to be able to, be pay, be able to pay for the gas, so you're stuck. You can't transfer to a friend, you can't even sell it, you can't maybe craft with it, so that is a major point of friction. And then if you do somehow acquire that, that asset, which is actually really difficult, um, you know, which is like the Matic to gas token, you have to know what, like, what's the gas limit and what's the gas price and how does it not get stuck, all these different ridiculous things that you shouldn't have to know anything at all about, right? Um, and this is where kind of the sequence relayer comes into play. This is something we recognize very early. And the idea is like when we think about wallet products and stuff like this, is the, the, the product that we're doing, it's really the infrastructure 
that really drives user usability. Right? Solving the problems at the infrastructure level and how you wrap yourself around it is what helps you actually make these things usable. So by, what's interesting is now that the assets were to live in a smart contract, if you want to call another smart contract, you can actually do that. And so you have this relay in between, think of it like a content delivery network that accelerates the speed at which these things go. You're kind of funneling them through this relay, which, which adds extra things to it. For instance, it's able to allow you to submit a, submit a transaction and sign something and it will actually submit the transaction to the network on your behalf. It can't change your signature, it can't modify what you're doing, but it can submit and it can make sure that it'll pay for your Matic token or your gas token so it can be executed on that, on that transaction. And it allows you to do extra things inside of it as well. So that's what this relayer does. And as a result, there's a few interesting benefits that, of what these constructions allow you to do. First, users can actually pay their gas token in any token that they want. So they could, the relayer, whatever the relayers may accept, they could say, you know, I'll take USDC or DAI or ETH or whatever. You could be on the Polygon network and you could be paying for your gas fees in USDC, which is really cool, right? And so you can have one universal token that works everywhere. Pretty neat. Still though, you still gotta get that USDC. Um, the other thing that most, pretty much every game that, that works with us is coming towards, and I think a lot of the ecosystem understands, which by the way, a lot of these things are becoming standardized, is this idea of sponsored gas. So what happens then is you might have a video game you deploy a few contracts of your tokens, maybe your marketplace, maybe a crafting contract, whatever your kind of program is. And what you can say, say is, for these contracts, when users interact with them, you'll actually pay for the user's gaf, gas on their behalf. And now some of these transactions could be a penny, less than a penny, actually it can be a tenth of a penny, depending on the network you're choosing. And so it's, think of it like a hosting cost. So users are coming in, and they're looking to do transactions, and now they don't have to think about gas at all. There is no gas for them, right? Because they're doing something on, on your contracts. And that's a really interesting model that we're seeing all these games. And it still supports the underlying blockchain so they can, be, they can function well. And again, that's a really popular way to do it. The Reeler also has other cool benefits. It unlocks this ability to, if you guys know, like transactions can sometimes feel slow or you have to do like one at a time. It has extra properties where you can actually batch them. And you can, in fact, even parallelize them. And then you can batch and parallelize them. You can do both. So it really, so for instance, if you're doing something on a server where you're issuing rewards, you're doing something like this, you can also use these very same techniques I'm talking about from a server wallet as well. You can actually instantiate sequence, by the way, on a server um, in the same way I'm talking about it, and you can take advantage, which is kind of neat, even though we have a UI, like a, a front-end facing thing, you can actually use it on the server just the same because the wallet is just, it actually is a thing that's on the, the blockchain. The other huge problem, it's like, is crazy, you know, we all build all, we, we work so hard to build these video games and then you wanna be able to monetize them and you wanna be able to sell them to normal users. And like the whole purpose is to build this for, not just like Web3 natives who are blockchain experts or like blockchain whales, you wanna build this for just Web2 gamers who wanna be able to own their items and do cool things, you know? So these users, it, there's, there's a, a very large path to going and acquiring USDC or other things. So this is a really important area and there's a lot of different like on-ramp providers that are you know, helping you figure out how to acquire USDC or Ether so that you can actually finally go and buy, them, buy something in the marketplace. There's a lot of challenges around that and I won't, I won't go into that, but what's interesting, I don't know what the next slide is, okay, but so there's this kind of whole movement in the ecosystem very simply called NFT checkout. And pretty much every single company out there is, is offering it at this point, or offering some version of it. And we in fact have one fully built into sequence as well, so you don't have to be really worrying too much about it as a developer, it's built into the SDKs. And it's this idea that instead of having to go buy the USDC to then go buy the, the actual underlying items, you, so, which is kind of neat, and if you think about like Steam or um, you know, Nintendo, you buy like the, or for, you know, in Epic, you, you buy like the, the V-Bucks, you know, and then you can actually go and, and use those credit systems to, to purchase things. And that makes sense in those worlds, but when you're buying USDC, it's a different kind of purchase. These are, because they're open loop systems. So the simple idea is you just skip all of that. You just go from credit card to buying the, the NFT directly. And as a result, it's recorded as a virtual good and you're able to kind of have a lot better ways of actually monet like being able to actually make these purchases happen. So many of you may know all this. If not, giving you that tip is gonna save you a lot of effort and energy. And I would just say, don't bother on-ramping USDC. Go, buy the, go help users buy the NFT directly. Um, the other thing, of course, is this idea of in-game balances. So when users have their collections and they have their assets. Now, the thing about it is that the source of truth is actually the blockchain, right? I'm gonna check my next slide on this as well. Okay, yeah. So the source of truth is the actual blockchain. And, you know, that, so things might actually happen that are outside of your game, right? And maybe you're helping encourage that, but users could do all sorts of things because it's an open ecosystem, but you wanna be able to represent the, the source of truth. So this is actually a little bit of a hard problem and it can be really slow to be able to, to acquire all these things or to be able to query these things. So, 
We have built something called the indexer, which quite simply think of it as just like a putting and making your blockchain feel like an API for querying NFTs, SFTs, tokens, metadata, balances, histories, ownership, supplies, real t like all the stuff in real time and tracking it. It's like, that's it. And if you think about databases, you know, if you guys, you know, anytime you like a, if your database is slow, the first thing your team's going to say, oh, we're probably missing an index. Better add a database index. You know, this is the same thing, right? This is just making an index off the blockchain data. And there's a lot of products out there. I will say ours is really good. Um, it's really fast. It works in real time and it has all the collections. There's, you don't even have to register your contract with us. It'll automatically detect it. Um, it works on anything EVM compatible and we can add, if there's more ones that come out, like this world of like blockchain scalability, which we'll talk about, as you guys probably most of you have heard about the idea of like layer twos. Um, there's now this kind of idea of layer three. Um, I don't think there's gonna be a layer four. I think we're done at layer three. So don't worry, um, but you know, sequence will, will just wrap itself around any one of these nodes and it's just like, that's it. It just wraps it and, and you can use it. And so it's nice is, yeah, we'll, we'll come back to that. But yeah, so the indexer is a very fantastic product that you will need. And in fact, what's cool is our wallet even uses it. Our wallet literally renders the things using the indexer, but you're free to use the indexer all you want as well, which has a lot of advantages to be able to m turn the blockchain into an API for reading all the data very easily. Um, the node gateway is also, an important product that we had created um, via the, the use of uh, having deployed Skyweaver. And, you know, we just found that it's, there's, it's difficult to make, you wanna have high availability and the node, which is the thing that actually is the blockchain like access, it's like the actual node RPC to the blockchain so you can query data, you can submit transactions, you need to make sure that's a, that has reliable access. Um, we just did find that there's a lot of great providers out there, but no single provider was, was reliable enough to offer us 99.9999% uptime. So we built a node gateway, um, which essentially is a bit of a load balancer um, server that actually goes across a bunch of different providers, including our own, and, offer, and does health checking and just offers high availability. So it's a pretty cool little, cool little product. Um, the neat thing also I'll say is with respect to Web3, what I love about it is, I, I, again, I love open systems, I love open infrastructure, I love open, you know, open source. And since these protocols are all you know, standardized, you can pick and choose and you can modularize and you can, you can put together multiple providers. Like, although we do have this all in one platform, you know, if you already are down a path, that's cool. You know, like keep doing that and you can layer on a bunch of technologies and, and keep extending them. They are gonna play nice together because they're all using the common formats. And so the other thing I kind of want to mention, I think, in the world of, of Skyweaver and from our perspective was, okay, how do we represent these virtual items on the blockchain, how do, these cards? And at the time, there did exist, this, there's two standards that existed when, while we were in the development of our video game. There was the ERC-20, the fungible token standard, that, like the single token, and then there was the ERC-721 token standard, which where every single thing is unique, every little thing. And when we were thinking about our video game, in fact, the ERC-1155 did not exist at this time. In fact, we were actually the co-authors of the ERC-1155, and for this reason. Um, is when we were looking at Skyweaver, we we're like, you know what? Not every single card needs to have its unique identifier. We're gonna have these 600, at the time it was 500 cards, and each one will have, for sure, its own unique ID, but there may be like 100 of them or 20 of them or 1,000 of them. There's gonna be different kind of copies of them, which makes sense, but they're the same. And I wanna know that the card I have is the same card that another person has, which has a lot of great benefits. For instance, I know like, oh, if you sell your cards for 10 bucks, my card's probably worth around 10 bucks too. You know, and also like if someone wants to trade with me, they know they're getting the kind of the equivalent copy. And I think the 1155 is a type of data structure that better represents video game assets, which is why we're seeing even it's cool to hear, you know, Robbie talk about how they're also leveraging this very same standard, actually. So it's an exciting standard, just kind of highlighting it for you guys. I think it's still cool to use the seven. Some teams actually use all three. Some teams use the 721 or 1155. You can actually put, interestingly, in the 1155, you can actually put ERC-20s and 721s inside of it, actually. Um, if you want to talk to me about it, I can tell you how or whatever, but it's an important thing, right? Devote, and what I'll, the last thing I'll tell you when you are thinking about your games and you're building them um, is that there's a lot of tools out there um, to actually go and, and there's standard contracts. You shouldn't be making your own contracts for these things either, right? Because if there's a bug, it could mean like a loss of funds for your users. You don't want that. It's a huge headache. These are already standardized. They're already programmed. They are, you know, we wrote some, we actually also been, even OpenSea actually was using our literal contracts for a number of years. Open Zeppelin has created a bunch of stuff that's been fully audited. And so I think there's a lot of like standard library, you know, like contracts that I think are really great to leverage. And just to kind of mention to you guys, um, we are releasing something called the Sequence Builder in a couple weeks, which is gonna be a whole dashboard to all the things we're talking about, which will actually have also a built-in minter for you to be able to take advantage of the stuff at a low level, but they're your contracts anyways. You could go like do other crazy stuff with them. So just to help you with that. The other thing to mention is 
you know, naturally now, okay, you have your game, you got your wallet, you got your, okay, gas is, we forget gas, gas is no longer a problem. Um, you know, you figured out how to, your, your tokens, you got that there. You want to be able to instantiate a marketplace so users can actually like comfortably be able to allow them to, to, to trade these things. And you got a few options, of course. So I'm going to check my next slide as well. Okay, cool. So yeah, um, you got a few options, right? So you could certainly go to OpenSea, which is a very trusted source, amazing product, and has a lot of great discovery and a lot of users. So I think there's a lot of great benefits of why you want to be in OpenSea as well. And I, you know, of course, encourage that. Very good for discovery. It's kind of like a, like a shopping mall, right? And now I think the other thing, though, is there's still challenges around that. You want to, for instance, have, I like to think of OpenSea as a, um, a third party secondary marketplace. But maybe you want to have a first party secondary marketplace, something that's built into your experience, something that's trusted, that's, that's right there. And that's kind of what we have over here with Skyweaver, right? You come in, it's, it's built in. We can also, you, you can establish the royalties that you've set up for yourself. Those cannot be changed. Those, can, those cannot be like circumvented um, versus, you know, someone going onto OpenSea and, you know, someone will do some crazy thing over like with Blur and start messing with the market. And so they have to be competitive and sl start slashing royalty fees, which would be, is, is obviously not, is no go, right? Over here, you can actually, by controlling the market and being a part of your experience, it's a few things. It's on your.com, you know, people know they can trust it. They don't have to worry like, oh, is this a scam one? Is this not a scam one? You can keep your royalties and it can be just a great experience that's fully, fully embedded. So it's less clicks, less, less to understand. So this is something that, you know, we, we offer a product called Nifty Swap that lets you do this. Um, there's there's a, a, like an SDK, it's, it can also be white labeled. There's APIs, it depends on how the, the, ver the, the effort you wanna take in terms of integration. It's actually not that hard, I'll be honest, because it's already kind of, been done for you, but I'm happy to help you with that, with that stuff as well. So I just wanted to mention, yeah, helping you. This, this is another aspect. And you know, we're not the only game in town either. There's, there's lots of other great products. And again, like I said, they're all are interoperable. Right? And you can pick and choose and mix, mix and match them together. Like you don't have to use our marketplace, you can use someone else's, but the wallet maybe will really work really well. And, and, think, and I'll also mention, just so happens, we use the indexer for this as well. This is powered by the sequence indexer. You know, These things just plug together like modules. Um, and you know, something that also many, perhaps many of you are, the first thing everyone starts with is like, okay, I got what network should I go on? You know, that's like a, it's a huge question and there's a lot of confusion. Um, and you know, we have Ethereum, Polygon, Avalanche, Arbitrum, Optimism, Binance, Phantom. I don't even know. I think there's a cool one coming out in Japan called Oasis. There's a bunch, you know, Coinbase base network now is coming out, all of these things. And then of course, Flow, Near, Solana, blah, 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 you know? And what I'll say is I really think the ship has sailed where EVM and Ethereum is really the standard for representing, you know, these blockchain systems. And every single person and user and all the tools and the ecosystem, it just, it's just already, it's been taken off. You get so, much, so many kind of exponential benefits by just adopting the EVM standard. And there's nobody who's really questioning that. A lot of people early on were saying, oh, you know, Ethereum doesn't scale. Oh, so we're just gonna build this other thing, you should build on my thing. And in fact, I'm gonna give you a bunch of money to build on my thing, you know? Um, but you're gonna spend that money on just making some stuff and then you gotta go make, who's gonna go make your wallet and everything else? You know what I mean? You're gonna spend all your wasting, wasting your time there not working on your game. So the good news is that I think the ship has sailed where that EVM is now the standard and in scalability wise, you look at companies like Polygon, the crazy stuff that they're doing that they've already been operating with the, even the ZK EVM that's coming out actually next week on March 27th. You look at Arbitrum, Arbitrum Nova, Arbitrum Orbit, Optimism, they even have like the layer three with base and stuff like that. This stuff is all, like, this is no longer a problem and, and there's so many great tools that don't make it your concern and picking a network from this perspective, I guess I would say is there's no really bad choices on this screen. You know what I mean? Um, I, you know, we may different people because they're all even compatible. You don't like when you go to another one, you know, it's like saying like, oh, I deploy on Azure um, or I deploy on Google or I deploy on Amazon. It's like, okay, if I'll just, I'll switch. It's not that easy of course, because it's like my, it's a little bit of a pain to migrate, but nevertheless, you don't rewrite your program. You don't rewrite your system, right? Um, and perhaps you start with a layer two and you want to upgrade to a layer three. So the net, the good news is I just encourage strongly to be thinking about an EVM chain and speaking to any one of these projects because they're all really good choices and you're not going to be concerned with, with these problems and you're going to get max compatibility. So this is the sequence stack, the sequence web three infrastructure stack, and it's, it's getting better every single day. So it's good, but it's even getting better, which I'm so excited about. Um, and we are going to be releasing the builder like you're seeing over there. It's really cool. Um, and we're really on this path to open sourcing as much as possible as well. Like if you do, if you do check our github.com slash zero X sequence, there's a ton of cool open source stuff. In fact, the stuff, everything we built off this on the fundamentals and the libraries are open source and we're just gonna keep doing more of that. Um, so yeah, um, so I guess we're gonna switch gears. I don't know what we're doing for time, but we're gonna switch gears into the panel now. Awesome, thanks so much, Peter. And thanks, Ravi, for your presentation earlier. 
Um, I just want to, in the interest of time, I want to allow the audience to ask questions to Peter and Robbie. Uh, but I just want to start with one question, and that's what excites each of you the most about Web3? In other words, you know, what do you see as the biggest opportunity for games that leverage Web3 technology? Peter talked about a lot of advantages around items, you know, particularly resale, value, uh, cross-game interoperability persistence and profile. So do any of those specific things stand out to you or perhaps there's something different? And Robbie, I'll pass the question to you to start. Sure, sure. Uh, what excites me is really the possibility of Web3 in India. Uh, we have 500, 700 million users uh, all signed up uh, already to use a you know Android device to kind of own digital assets, trade between them. Uh, and that kind of excites me, just that possibility of people kind of trading between each other, owning digital assets, that's, that's probably what we're building for. Awesome. And Peter, anything you'd like to share? Yeah, I think um, I'm very excited just to see what developers do in the design space to go and unlock and experiment. There's, there's so much that hasn't been tried with these systems and so many permutations. And I think those are going to unlock so many, they're going to inform so many things we do, even in the real world and how our, like, our real, world, real world economies function, actually, and governance and all these things. That's something really interesting and very like future. but. The other thing I'm excited about, and I think what represents kind of the holy grail of of this like economic loop, is UGC. You know, user generated content. The idea that like you take all these properties and you have something, and then users in the platform enough that someone actually can keep extending it, and there's an incentive for users to keep evolving it, like this ever evolving game. I just can't wait to see that happen. It's going to happen. Obviously, you got to put all these things together masterfully and all these things, but or maybe simply, which would be masterfully. But when that happens, there's going to be this very interesting flywheel that's going to take off and create a lot of value. You can compare it to something like a Roblox, obviously. And Roblox, of course, has created a lot of value, but a different way that's, a little, that's obviously more open, which requires change. Um, but very, very powerful. And I think it will be very creative. And that is metaverse. You know, when I see that, that, is, that equals metaverse. Yeah. That's awesome. And just also the way that users and developers will be able to share value through that. So like UGC could, for example, in Skyweaver, if players started creating Skyweaver items, they could sell in the Skyweaver market. Those creators could earn a royalty every time it trades. And then so too could Skyweaver as a transaction fee, creating this like really symbiotic relationship between the players and the creator. And there's another notion of, you know, Peter mentioned cross game interoperability. There's also like an idea I'm really excited about with cross-brand interoperability. So I imagine everyone here has heard of 2K, right? Like the NBA games. So imagine if NBA 2K24, for example, if it implemented Web3 items and anyone who owned Nike merchandise as a Web3 item in the game, the actual brand Nike could just go and gift items to all of those holders and they could gift them, let's say digital Nike shoes or even a voucher to get 50% off physical Nike goods next time they visit the store. And Nike could even do this permissionlessly. Like they don't have to ask 2K for approval to do this. They could just look at the wallets on the blockchain and reward those users um, as a gift. And I'm really excited to see how different people, uh, games and brands collaborate in these, these open ecosystems. And so we just have about 10 more minutes. So I'd love to open it up to the audience, if, if anyone ha here has a question for uh, Peter or Robbie. This is it right here? Uh, I believe so, yeah. All righty. All right, thank, thank you so much, guys, for, for your presentations. I, I, my question actually was going to be around community-generated IP in the Web3 space. Um, where do you feel the, the bridge can be aligned? Where, where, where would it make sense for user-generated uh, um, assets, such as like from the mod culture you find in Roblox, um, and bridging that between also the designers rewarding the players um, contributing to that gaming ecosystem. Where do you find, um, when do you find that bridge uh, uh, applicable um, when the timing is right? Yeah, I think that, you know, there's companies trying to do it like Sandbox, Decentraland, where they have creator tools and they may have an underlying currency that's allowing people to use it to kind of craft with it or burn it to be able to construct something new and then sell it and to kind of add more content and a bit of this flywheel. So that is being experimented with. And I think there are certain games that I think that fits better than others. Like an MMO obviously is perfect. Um, I think it's obvious in, in the world of Skyweaver, like we don't want people just making random cards, obviously. Um, but there's other things that you can think about. So um, yeah, that's depending on the experience. I think the open world systems that 
you can just picture this thing just keep changing and evolving forever. And it can be really this thing that anyone can, can create into. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's what I think. Yeah. No, wonderful. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you. Hi. Uh, definitely love your uh, presentation. Uh, thank you for that. And then this question is uh, for Peter. So I love the idea, all the, um, uh, all the ideas about like uh, Skyweaver, uh, but I got questions about the uh, relayer. Mm -hmm. So uh, number one um, is how, how, like how much or how many nodes do, do you expect to deploy for uh, as a relayer because, you know, like uh, uh, the availability and how to decide, for example, the, the, the sequence of the transactions, how do you decide the, you know, the order of the transactions because you are not using the uh, transaction gas fee system, right? Uh, no more. So that would be one question. Uh, second one, uh, are you concerned about like SIBO attacks? And then number three is, uh, so for, for web two users, they're okay, but for web three users, do you, are you, do you think they will concern about like uh, front running and so on? Yeah. Well, we have an expert question here. Um, so uh, yeah, I'll say that, um, yeah, very, very good questions. So first, like with the nodes, and so we do run relayers per, there's actually about 60 relayers per network. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they're all different because of course they're talking to the specific chain. And what I'll say about the relayer network in general is we, we do run it. But in fact, if you've heard of this standard called EIP 4337, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, very popular. Hey, hey, yeah. The whole idea is to actually decentralize the relayer network. It would be like this adjacent mempool that lives on top, like uh, across all these networks. And those will be actually peer to peer based. So it's interesting that they'll create a lot of resilience and high availability with that, right? In terms of like, um, your other question was Sybil attacks and it was also, what was the other one? Front running. Front running. Yeah, yeah. yeah the ordering. Um, Ordering right now, we just go, we just kind of go first in, first out. You know, we just, it's just like a queue that goes in as fast as possible. And as long as you, you kind of select, it does the best estimate it can for the gas pricing. And, it, and that's pretty much it. It kind of round robins and does first in, first out as fast as possible. Um, but there is obviously op ways of optimizing, or perhaps there's value there in, in what you're referring to. Like, there's interesting techniques of what people might, ordering could get a bit more sophisticated. In terms of civil attacks, there isn't an attack, there is no attack when you're, when the users are paying for the gas, obviously, right? right? When the users are selecting like USDC or this or that, whatever, well, there is no civil attack because they're ultimately agreeing to pay that fee. So they would be, you know, they're just, they're, they're pretty much subset, they're, they're paying, they're just swapping what they're paying for instead, right? On a sponsored transaction basis, it's true. Someone could attack the sponsor and actually go and like, you know, civil attack that and, and, and drains from that gas tank. Um, so you just kind of protect against that and, and, and look at that as well to limit it per wallet and stuff like this. But that is a little bit of a threat, I would agree. Um, but yeah, but I'll to, we'll look into it some bit more. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so it's like there's a dilemma too because, uh, for example, if we have two fill relayers, right, then the latency might be key. So someone far away might might have sent the the transaction earlier, but the the transaction re is received like later. So that the order is, you know, right. It, it, it can, yeah. yeah. I see what you're saying for sure. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. I think it's. Um, it can happen. Even the node could fail. You're talking to a node, but yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Very good question. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for your answer. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Hi. Thank you very much. So um, I apologize. I, I missed the first part of the of the talk. You did mention that you wanted to put like uh, games from India on the map. What are some example of games from India that people need to check out that I might not have heard of? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, well, definitely uh, Tower Conquest is like, it's actually, you can go play downstairs on the second floor, just downstairs escalators and iPad, it's actually really good. Awesome. Skyweaver, have you tried Skyweaver? No. Yeah, check it out, skyweaver.net, you can get it on your computer, you can get it on your phone, like Android, iPad, um, yeah, and iPhone. And um, you know, other ones that are really cool would be something in development, I would say is, is Dead Drop, it's pretty new. Um, in terms of games I like, there's another game called Boomland, or Hunters on Chain, sorry, is the game. And I still, like those are like, see what else, I mean there's lots, there's obviously Gods Unchained, which is really cool from the Immutable folks, um, which is actually like another TCG. Um, I would say there's still not enough good games, you know, I think, but the, as I kind of mentioned in my first part actually was that it's really the first gen, you know, and, but there are a lot of great studios, including like Square Enix, who's working on something, you know, it's just public yeah. information. Square Enix uh, in India? 
Oh, I think, yeah, I think his question was games in India. Oh, I'm so sorry, man. I apologize. Yeah. I didn't hear that part. So maybe, yeah, yeah Robbie, Robbie you so, want to chime in? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so ignore what everything I said. <laughs> I'm still going to check them out. No, got you got one. one. I got one, okay. Um, <laughs> so I think uh, what we're doing slightly differently is to kind of take a look at all of our games which have been successful on Web2, uh, which actually have a potential to kind of build an on-chain economy. Mm -hmm. Like I won't build Solitaire on-chain. I'll actually think of something that's much more long-term, something that people will enjoy playing. Uh, haven't seen a lot of games come out of India yet. Uh, but definitely enough teams working on a game. Uh, not a lot of these have announced yet, but seeing the opportunity kind of grow up, grow in India. Tao Conquest is just our first game. We, we actually have a new one called Puzzle Island, uh, followed by Indus, of course. Okay, awesome. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thanks. Cool. So um, yeah, we're out of time now. But for anyone that wants to, you know, dive into a deeper conversation. We have our sequence lounge downstairs on the second floor. It's big and purple. You won't miss it. And uh, yeah, just thank you for everyone's time today and we look forward to connecting with you all.